Okay, this week I'll be talking about more in depth on imaging pulse sequences, um, in particular gradient echo imaging, and we'll also talk about fast spin echo imaging, which is um, an imaging sequence that's in the family of echo train pulse sequences. Before we get into that, though, I want to discuss uh, some uh, a little bit more about 2D imaging in general. Uh, the so-called sequential versus interleaved acquisition. So in this top figure, what I'm showing on the left is uh, the acquisition order for a sequential acquisition. These blocks represent slices through uh, some kind of sample or the human body, and where each black line here represents one case baseline. So if you look at the inner loop here, we do we would do signal averaging first on the first case baseline. So if we had four averages, we would do we would acquire this line four times. And then we would move to the next line here four times, do averaging, and next line and, and so on until all the lines for this slice were acquired. But then we move to the outer acquisition loop which is slice location, so that means we move to the next slice. Acquire the first case baseline, average, and so on and so on until we make it to the final slice. Now for interleaved acquisition, we do have a different ordering of the acquisition loops. So the first case baseline could be up here or it could be down here. Um, so it would be acquired and then averaging would be performed, well, for the next average, I'm sorry, first slice location, inner loop, then we go to the next slice, gather the, gather that uh, data case baseline, go to the next slice, gather that case baseline, then we go to another slice location, uh, oops, yes, So I go to, we go to the next phase encoding or the next case space line. Okay, and we go to the next slice. Do any averaging on that line that we might need. And then we go to the next slice. Do any averaging on that line that we may need. And then the outer loop again. We move to the next case space line, which would be the third line, and so on and so on until we all of our lines. So you can see that the acquisition order is quite different between these two methods and certain pulse sequences are <coughs> more suited for sequential and, and certain sequences are more suited for the interleaved type. And so gradient echo sequences are, are, are good candidates for sequential acquisition because they have a short TR while Sequences that need a longer TR are, are good candidates for interleaved acquisition so that you can uh, achieve a certain image contrast and signal to noise ratio. So we'll talk some now about some gradient echo techniques. There really are just two <coughs> flavors of gradient echo imaging, that being incoherent or spoiled, incoherent, in which the transverse magnetization is refocused. In this case, this is called fast imaging in the steady state, or FISP, FISP. Now I wanted to just show a, a table of the different acronyms, just to give you a feel for um, how many different acronyms can be made just for gradient echo sequences, um, not only in themselves, but also between the vendors. So it's it's quite a, uh, some people call it a zoo of pulse sequences. And if you want to know, learn more about these other types of sequences that we won't discuss too much, uh, such as True FISP, uh, this book, The Handbook of MRI Pulse Sequences, is a very good reference. And when talking about gradient echo, spoiling is a uh, big topic. So I'd like to discuss that a little bit here. The spoiling in general means that you disperse the unwanted transverse magnetization at the end or the start of the pulse sequence. And what that means is, let's say you have um, a long, or if you if you have 
magnetization at the end of your sequence that you want to get rid of, then you would want to spoil it. And we can do that by one of three methods. We can do that by using a long TR. So we can just have, let's say, one second between our 90 degree pulses. Then the MRI signal would have decayed away. Again, this is great in echo. So our MRI signal would have decayed away by the time the next TR happens. So that's kind of an automatic way to do spoiling. Now, alternatively, we could use unipolar gradients at the end of the sequence to spoil the transverse magnetization that is unwanted. Or we could change the phase of the RF pulse, which I'll show you here on the next slide. I'll talk a little bit about gradient spoiling as well. So spoiling by gradients is accomplished by inserting a gradient into the sequence either after this after the pulse sequence has finished and before the next TR or before the start of the sequence but after what are called preparatory RF pulses. In this gradient in the spoil gradient is typically called a trapezoid if it has this shape and it can be applied along either the X, Y, or Z direction or all directions. And how would we spoil by changing the phase of the RF pulses? First, the important thing here is to not confuse the phase of the RF pulse with the flip angle of the RF pulse. So here, what I'm showing by the red arrow is flip angle of about 20 degrees and the first for the first TR the phase of the RF pulse resulted in the transverse magnetization pointing along this axis here which is called that the Y axis and, but at the second TR the phase of our RF pulse remember not the flip angle the flip angle is the same the phase of the RF pulse has changed so that the direction of the mag transverse magnetization has come off of the, uh, is now kind of in the XY plane. It's not directly on the Y axis. And the next TR, we have a different phase, and so on, and so on. And this series of events where the RF phase has changed is called phase cycling. And there is a specific equation. Usually the phase is changed as a quadratic function. So it's not just a random, um, you know, the phases are not just randomized. But there's a specific equation which tells you or can give you the optimal spoiling by this method. So we've, we've discussed why gradient echo was fast before, but I want to go over this just real briefly again to remind you. Um, again, we're in gradient echo imaging, we usually apply a very short or small flip angle, and that results in just a small difference, just a small loss of long longitudinal magnetization, but a relatively large increase in transverse magnetization. So if we compare these two, uh, if we just pull them out, this little section is the loss here. This section is the gain in transverse magnetization here. So clearly there, there is a big difference. So we can use a short, very short TR because in between TRs, although we have a small flip angle, we have, we're able to achieve a, a large amount of transverse magnetization relative to the amount of longitudinal magnetization that we've lost. And when talking about gradient echo sequences, it's important to talk about uh, the so-called steady state. So just in general, steady state is just a state of dynamic equilibrium. So we'll just use this bucket of water analogy here. So if you have a bucket of water that's in a steady state, and let's say your bucket of water is leaking, then to be in a steady state you would need water going in at the same volume that it's flowing out. And so now, so now of course we want to talk about the steady state in, in graded echo imaging. 
So remember, in Great Echo Imaging, we only have one RF pulse. Usually the flip angle, we just call it theta, is less than 90 degrees. And before the first pulse, we have M0. And what I'm assuming here between these pulses is that the transverse magnetization completely decays away. So I'm only going to consider a longitudinal magnetization. So if we consider MZ at point A, at point B, we have MZB equals MZA times cosine of theta, where theta is a flip angle. And from B to C, we have, of course, T1 relaxation. So MZ at C is given by this equation, which you've seen before. So at the steady state, to achieve the steady state, we want the situation where Again, this, these pulses just keep repeating, so just picture these as being repeated. We want the situation where mz at some c down the line equals mz at some a down the line here. Now, I'm not, ne not necessarily the second and third pulse, but somewhere down here, this situation will be achieved, and that's the steady state. And since, again, we assumed that the transverse magnetization was gone, so this is a spoiled sequence because there is no transverse magnetization. It doesn't really matter right now how it was spoiled. Uh, it just We'll just call it spoiled. So this is the signal equation for this type of sequence. So this, this we can use to predict what the, uh, what the signal would be in certain tissues that have, excuse me, I'm trying to get my cursor back here, uh, that have, so if you knew the T1 and the T2 star of the tissues, just by applying TR, TE, and a certain flip angle, you could predict what the, um, what the tissue contrast would be. And that signal equation is maximized when this angle here is set to the so-called Ernst angle, which is given by this equation, our cos angle whose cosine is e to the minus tr over t1. So if we go back to our steady state analogy, the bucket of water here, the water really is the longitudinal magnetization. So if we have, if the water level is going up and down, then we, we are not in a dynamic equilibrium state. And just as in the great and echo situation, if our longitudinal magnetization throughout the sequence is not stable or is not steady, okay, we don't, we're not in a steady state. When the water going in is analogous to the T1 recovery, and the water coming out is analogous to the excitation pulse. So I want to show some more images of our uh, famous kiwi fruit. Uh, these were taken by a sequence called fast low angle shot or flash, and these are T2 star and T1 weighted, and first row here, uh, they're T2, weight, T2 star weighted because the flip angle is very short, very low. The next row has a flip angle of 90 degrees, so they're more T1 weighted. And to get an appreciation of the difference in contrast between these two, I just subtracted this row of images from the first row of images to give this, these difference images. So these are just, uh, these images were not again acquired by the machine, they're just processed, these are just subtraction images to show you the difference in contrast between the T2 star weighted images and the T1 weighted images. So you can see that there's something going on in the T2 star weighted image here. Since they're brighter, you lose that signal in the T1 weighted image. Okay, so let me go. Let me go back here just to say something real quick about T2 star and T1 and T1 weighted imaging with regard to the flip angle. 
you can see that if we have a low foot angle like I, I'm showing here, that the longitudinal magnetization is not changed very much. So if we're not changing the longitudinal magnetization significantly, then we're going to restrict our T1. We're going to restrict the weighting of the image to, to something other than T1. Okay, to get a T1 weighted image, we really need to be uh, changing the longitudinal mag magnetization significantly. And also, in order to get a T2 star or T2 weighted image, we need to be changing the transverse magnetization significantly. So here, we could say that we're more T2 star weighted than we are T1 weighted if we have a low flip angle. And remember, for graded echo, we cannot be T2 weighted because we do not refocus. We do not refocus the magnetization, so we can, our signal is always an FID. Okay, just a, just a couple slides briefly to discuss some clinical apl applications of T2 star weighted imaging. They're commonly used, this type of imaging is commonly used for looking at hemorrhage in general. Hemorrhage is <clears throat> the products of hemorrhage. Or if you have, if you have a large amount of bleeding in the brain or in other other organs, you will have a buildup of iron, which is a paramagnetic. So it will dephase your signal. And that, since T2 star weighted imaging is sensitive to dephasing, you can have uh, you can hemorrhaging will actually weight. Your, well, the teacher star weighted image ends up being sensitive to that hemorrhage. Another type of application is susceptibility weighted imaging. And this is another form of teacher star weighted imaging, but it adds, it, it adds some more information, such as the phase of the image. And this is useful for detection of stroke, epilepsy, brain tumor characterization. Perfusion weighted imaging is a very interesting type. Uh, it, it allows you to look at blood flow, for example, near tissue after a stroke, which is very important because clinicians want to know what regions of the brain still have blood flow after after stroke, and that can help guide in uh, in, in prognosis. And also in Alzheimer's disease, another thing to do is uh, to be able to tell what parts of the brain are still perfused with blood. And this can be also be used in other organs as well. So that's that's all for this particular topic. And uh, again, as the uh, as the outline in the this week's module indicates, please please try to read through Hishemi uh, chapters 19 and 20, I believe, are the ones that deal with great and echo imaging.